The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Who doesn't love autumn? I mean, the temperatures are getting cooler, finally I could go outside and my face doesn't melt, football is on, and if you're a parent, your kids are going back to school. But if you're a student, obviously this is not your favorite time of year. But for me, it ushers in a period of the year that I could focus on smaller projects and a lot of fun little projects that I can give away as gifts. So it's just a real fun time of the year for me. Now in the past, we've done Christmas projects. Most of the time is what we focus on. But, uh, you know, there's a few projects out there that you can do for things like Halloween. You want to get into the spirit? How about some nice Halloween bowls? Now, a lot of people think that bowls, the only way you can make them is on the lathe, but it's not true. You can make bowls a number of different ways, and one of those is with a router. So Eagle America has these great kits, not only for Halloween, but also for Christmas, and you know, maybe we'll do one of those. But right now, I want to focus on the Halloween ones. Now, I've got a couple templates here. You can see I've got one that's a, a witch, oh, that's an upside down witch. A witch's head, the hat is on the top and her pointy little nose is on the bottom. I've got, uh, this is half of a bat, so you would have to flip it over to get the other half. And this one seems to be the one that is the most popular, at least in the Spagnola house, is the ghost. Okay, so the idea here is that by using a router and a special type of bit and one of these uh, templates, you can make these awesome little bowls. They're very, very cool. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to make some Halloween bowls using these Eagle America kits. Now the templates themselves are just made from plastic. And I think if you're, you know, sufficiently motivated and artistically inclined, you could certainly make something like this yourself. But for me, it's just a lot easier to buy one of these kits. Um, these still have the paper on them. It gives you an idea of what the shape is. So you could buy each one of these. I believe these are the only three that they have right now. You can also get a few things to make this process easier. For instance, they sell a big plate like this for your router. And what that does is makes the process of balancing your router over this opening as you hollow out the material just makes it a lot easier because you've got a lot more support with a big old, you know, what is this, probably 12 by 12 base like this. Also, you may want to consider the bit. Now, you're going to need a pattern bit to make this has a bearing on the top and the cutter head is here on the bottom and that will ride around the template and hollow it out. The thing is, you need a special bit. Now you can go with a standard pattern bit that has a square edge on it. The problem is that's going to create a real tight, sharp corner. It, with a bowl, it looks a little bit nicer if you have a rounded corner. So these bits are, are sort of specialized for this task and create a nice interior corner that's a little bit more pleasant to look at. So the one that I'm going to make today is the ghost, uh, primarily because that's what the boss wants and secondarily because it's probably one of the easier ones out of the three. So the stock for this, according to the instructions, they recommend at least two inches thick. Think about it. The thicker it is, the deeper your bowl is going to be. If you go less than two, it may start to get a little bit fragile and it may be more of a tray than a bowl, but that's perfectly fine too because if you're just putting candy in it, it doesn't really need to be all that deep. But of course, you could go deeper if you wanted to. So the way I'm going to get the stock is, I mean, there's a number of ways you could do this. If you don't have really wide or really thick stock, you're going to have to glue the pieces up to get the size that you need. You may also look into possibly like a platter blank that someone would use for turning. And to turn a big platter, you might be able to find a stock with the dimensions that you're looking for. But most likely, you're going to have to glue up from smaller pieces. For me, what I have is some leftover stock for my trestle table project, and I'm lucky enough that this stuff is wide and can handle the entire ghost in one shot without having to glue multiple pieces together. Now, of course, to do this, even if you glue them up, you're still going to need to flatten these pieces after the glue up goes together. And you guys know I talk about this hybrid approach to woodworking using power tools and hand tools. Well, that's critical in this part because you can't joint a board this wide, okay? So let me show you the technique that I use to get to this point where I'm ready to glue these two pieces together. Now, what I've got here is a piece of mahogany in the bench ready to go. And what I want to do, the primary goal here is to get one side flat enough. I'm not looking for absolute perfection here. If you're good with your hand planes and you want to do that, there's no reason why you can't go all the way with the hand planes. I just want to get it flat enough so that I can get accurate registration on my planer. 
So I've got my number five plane here. And before I do any removal of wood, I need to know what I'm up against. So a straight edge will help me determine what I'm looking at. Basically, I want to sight from the side here like this and see what we're dealing with. So when I place the straight edge across this way, I can see I've got some low points in here over on this side, low points over here, a little bit of a low point there. To run it across this way, you can see we're high in the middle here, pretty comparable, we're high in the middle here. And if you have a set of winding sticks, which I don't really have, but I've got a piece of wood that I know is straight and I've got a straight edge that I know is straight, I could use those to determine if there's any twist by sighting down from this angle. And as you look from that end, these winding sticks will essentially exaggerate the twist. And you can see we definitely have some twist to deal with. This end looks high. So the first thing we need to do is remove some material from this back corner to remove the twist from the board. Now I know what a lot of you are thinking, you're relatively new to the sport of woodworking and you're thinking that you don't have the hand plane skills to accomplish this. Well guess what? Neither do I, but I'm not going to let it stop me. The point is, I'm not really trying to get a perfectly flat surface here. What I'm going to do is try and get a surface that's stable so that I could pass it through the planer and let the planer do the work. So here's the thing, first thing I want to do is start removing that material. And what I have here is a number five. Quite frankly, you can use just about any plane you've got in your arsenal. Just set it so that it's taking a relatively aggressive cut. And you probably don't want to use your smoother here because it'll take you forever. Okay? As long as I start removing some of the stock, we're headed in the right direction. Now I'm not going to show you this entire process because this does take a little bit of time, but I want to get through the main primary points here. So once we've removed that, uh, the twist, we can start focusing on getting this thing so it sits nice and stable in that planer. And the way I'm going to do it is not necessarily by aiming for flat. What I'm going to aim for is slightly concaved. If I could remove a little bit of extra material from the middle, all I have to focus on is my outside edges to make sure that those are nice and straight and there's no twist. And if that's the case, I could then flip this puppy over, send it through the planer, perfectly stable, no problems. So this is why I say you don't need to be an absolute expert in hand planes to get this done. Okay, so set your plane for an aggressive cut again. And we're just gonna plane some stock here from the center. It's rough going here at first, obviously, but we'll get it after a few passes. At this rough stage, don't be afraid to go diagonal and cross grain. Now I've got a sufficient amount of material removed from the middle, and when I place my straight edge on here, I can see we've got a nice gap down there that tells me we've got a concave surface. I know that there's no twist because I've checked it with my winding sticks. So really all I want to do at this point is make sure that the edges are relatively smooth and flat so that this thing rides through the planer nice and smooth. So just a couple passes here. right on the edge like this, that's really all you need. And that's gonna register perfectly on the planer. So now that you get the idea for how the pieces are prepped, I'm gonna go ahead and glue these two together. Probably should have cut these parts to the same size before doing this, but I never said I was smart. So 
So my glue has had plenty of time to cure, and now we can trace on the shape of our little ghost. Nothing really tricky here, just place it wherever you think it looks good. If you see any flaws in the surface, you want to avoid those. And you want to make sure that you realize this is just the inside of the bowl. You're going to need a lip on the outside. And, you know, I guess you could make it as thick as we want, but, uh, you know, you probably want to give yourself at least a half inch there, just to be sure. So we don't want to go too close to the edge. I was worried about this line here, but, you know, it is what it is. I guess I could always angle my ghost this way to avoid it if I wanted to. Yeah, let's do that. Right about there. Just going to take a sharp pencil and trace the inside shape. So at my drill press, I'm going to use a Forstner bit. In fact, it's the biggest one I happen to have and sharpest. And I'm going to use that to plow away the bulk of the material here. There's no reason to use your router for all this. It's going to basically save wear and tear on your bit and on the router itself. The only thing we need to be concerned about is the depth. How far down does this bit go? Now, I've got a mark here at about 5 eighths of an inch, and the instructions tell me that you want at least a half inch bottom for this bowl. So at 5 eighths, I think, you know, as long as I'm a little bit over, I'm fine with that. So I'm going to use that line to set the depth of the bit. And right about there should do the trick. One down, a couple thousand to go. Now before doing any routing, I'm going to attach the template to the workpiece with screws. Normally I use double stick tape for this kind of thing, but I don't really want to take any chances that this is going to move on me. So a couple of countersunk screws will do the trick. Two things to be very careful of here. Number one, you want to make sure that the countersink is deep enough that the screw doesn't provide, you know, doesn't sit proud of the surface because that'll get in the way of our router. And the second thing is you want to make sure that these screws are well inside the waste that we'll be cutting away later. And these are definitely way out there. So now I've got my router outfitted with the plastic base that's going to give me all the extra support that I need to span that gap. And I even have my router bit in here, which is the special pattern bit with a rounded bottom. That's going to be perfect for making this bowl. Now, the first pass that I'm going to take is going to be around the perimeter. And the idea is I want to be very careful because I still have a lot of material to remove. And all those waves from the router bit or from the uh, Forstner bit Every time the bit confronts one of those waves, it's going to want to push it along. It's a, all of a sudden a big you know, chunk of material. So you have to take it slow and just make sure we make that first pass around uh, without going too fast. So we'll take our time with it. So for this first pass, I'm going to set my bit height so that the bearing is just above my plexiglass base, which means it'll ride nice and secure against the template. So push it down and lock it in place. Yeah, that looks good. Now we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, you see we're starting to establish our shape nicely here. It's starting to look really good. Uh, I think I'm going to get rid of this big giant piece of material here. That just looks like it is going to be trouble. So now I'm going to lower the bit about a quarter inch more, and I'm just going to keep going lower and lower until I reach the full extent, uh, or until I reach the bottom. And it depends on your setup, how deep your bowl is, depends on your router. Now you'll notice that eventually the bearing comes off of the template and it starts riding along the surface of the wood, which is perfectly fine because the wood is the same shape as the template. So just keep going down, down, down until you hit the bottom. Now I'm going to remove the template because at this point it's not really serving any purpose. This will allow me to get a little bit more out of my router bit. Now I'm getting ready to do my final cleanup pass and you could tell 
basically because the bit is contacting the bottom, which means when I start the router, I'm going to need to start it with it lifted up and then slowly bring it down. Uh, I probably will do the perimeter first and then work my way sort of freeform in the center areas and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll clean it all out and it'll be uneventful. Now that pretty much does it. It's a pretty nice smooth bottom. The corners are nice. A um, little bit of sanding. I don't think it's going to need much more work. Now there are a few high points that I couldn't hit with the router and frankly I'm blind when I have the router up there. I can't see anything so uh, it's going to be a little tricky to get those. So I'm just going to use a chisel with the bevel down like this and I'll be able to flatten that area out and remo remove the excess material. Now we're going to need to trace around the outside perimeter using a compass just to basically create the rim. And again, this is something that's adjustable, depends on what your personal preference is. I'm going for a little bit over a half inch here. And I'm just going to trace around. Now at the bandsaw, I've got a nice narrow blade here that's going to be very uh, helpful for getting around all these tight corners and things. And I'm just going to take my time. This is not something you want to rush. So I'm going to try and trace around very carefully and get as close to my line as I possibly can. Uh, the better I am at this, the less I'm going to have to sand later. Even though I have a pretty narrow blade, I still like to make relief cuts in the deep valleys whenever possible. This takes a lot of pressure off the blade when it comes time to turn those sharp corners. Also keep in mind that the sharper you make those inside corners, the harder it's going to be to sand. So I'm keeping mine relatively round. I do the final shaping on the outside using an oscillating spindle sander. Now with the bulk of the outside sanded, I have to get all of these little parts here. Uh, if you don't have an oscillating spindle sander, that's okay. You can still get most of these, you know, with a sanding block of some sort. And I'll show you a couple little sanding implements that I have that really make this go faster. But at this point, really, there's nothing left to do but put it in the bench and start sanding. So what I'm going to use mostly here are these little sanding helpers. They're just uh, rubber, flexible sanding pads. And you sort of just wrap a piece of sandpaper around them like this. And you could really get down into those tight areas and just kind of wrap around here. If you want to, you could use the other end and you could see some of them have different profiles and you could try to match the profile of some of these inner curves. And sand this way, roll it through like that. There's a lot of different things that you can do, but there's no way to get around it. You need to sand a lot here to make sure that this, uh, the end grain looks good and the side grain looks good. Now with the outside sanded to 180 grit, of course you can go to 220 if you like, 180 is where I like to stop. Uh, we've got to sand the inside here and this is not the easiest thing to do. You're going to have to get creative and do the best you can. The good news is that the surface left by the router bit is pretty darn smooth. So honestly, it doesn't need a whole lot of work. Uh, but for the most part in here, I think this is going to have to be by hand. All these inside side walls, you know, this little curvature here down at the bottom. But fortunately, your fingers are actually pretty good sanding blocks for stuff like this. So just take your time and get it right. Now one thing that may wind up getting you here is uh, these really deep corners in there. A little bit tricky to get to. I found that if I've got some burning down there, my uh, flex cut carving tools with sort of have this interchangeable handle. I've got various different profiles that I can use and those are very, very handy for getting down into these corners and just kind of scooping up a little bit 
and pulling out some wood. These are very sharp. So, you know, a couple strokes is all it takes to get the burnt stuff off. And then if you can, try and squeeze some sandpaper down there and smooth it out. Now, of course, with a candy dish like this, or really any woodworking project, you wanna make sure that your corners are broken to some extent. So just a little bit of sandpaper is all it takes to ease the edges, and that'll stop little hands from getting splinters and uh, cuts and things like that. Uh, or you could take it to the extent that I did. You could use your uh, small roundover bit on all these edges to give it a nice, clean, consistent, and soft look. So of course you want to do the inside edge, the outside edge, and this bottom edge too. Now let's talk a little bit about the finish for our little ghost here. Honestly, you could use just about anything. If you like oils, go ahead and use an oil. If you like a varnish, go ahead and use a varnish, water-based, whatever you want. I don't see any reason why this particular thing needs to be food safe because although you may be putting candy in there, it's going to be either hard candy or pre-wrapped candy. So uh, food exposure really isn't much of a concern. For me, a decent, durable finish that dries quickly is going to be the key because uh, I may make multiples of these. And if I do, I want to make sure that I could spray them all uh, with finish, get them to dry really quickly. Oil-based finishes, it takes a couple days, right? You know, to get the finish on there, let it dry, sand it back. You know, and this process takes a couple days. Well, if you're trying to get through these things in a weekend, that can be kind of an inconvenience. So a quick drying finish is great. And these water-based varnishes these days are really, really good. So that's what I'm gonna go for. And uh, I'll probably just spray out in my driveway on some saw horses. Now, if you've used water-based finishes before, you know that as soon as that material hits the wood and the wood dries, it gets really rough. So you wanna pre-raise the grain by spraying it with some water. I just use a spray bottle, give it a good soak. And come back with a paper towel and wipe up all that extra stuff. You don't really want it to pool so much, but you just want it saturated briefly and then dry it off. And what that will do is raise that grain for us so we can sand it one more time back with uh, maybe 220, 180, whatever your preference is, and then we could start applying our coats of finish. The HVLP gun has three fan settings, vertical, horizontal, and circular. For an oddly shaped piece like this, you'll probably want to use all three strategically. Once the top dries, I can flip the piece over and finish the bottom. I'll apply a total of four coats with 400 grit sanding in between. And here is my ghost bowl. I think I will name him Casper. This, uh, this project was a lot of fun, really straightforward. I wouldn't really say that there's any, uh, you know, twist to it or anything that's going to uh, surprise you. The one thing I will warn you, though, is to be very careful about the thickness. If you go too thick on this, most routers will have a problem extending the bit far enough when you plunge down so that you can actually clean out the bottom. I just barely made it with my router, so I cut it very, very close. So it's something I recommend you sort of look at your router, plunge it all the way down, and just make sure you know how far you can get in terms of depth before you make your decisions on how thick to go and how thick to leave the bottom. Um, you know, and I will mention about the finish here, this water-based finish is fantastic stuff. I've got about four coats on here in one day. So a project like this really can be a weekend thing. You do um, you know, part of the project, the building stuff, on Saturday, Sunday you can come out and take care of the finish as long as you use a quick drying finish. So very happy with the results. I hope you guys take the time to build one or six of these. And again, with these gift projects, I always recommend batching them out. If you do one and you show somebody, I guarantee you're gonna get a request for about five or six. So you may as well build those to start. Uh, I've got some of the other templates that I promised some people already that I'd make, so I gotta get back to work. But uh, before I do, let's fill this puppy with some candy. Now we add the candy. Unfortunately, it's only 70 to 80 calories per pack. You see, we like the good candy in the Spagnola house, not the cheap stuff. Now, for some people, this could be a problem. It's still a couple weeks before Halloween, and you have to sit here and look at all this delicious, wonderful candy until then. But fortunately, I have this little thing called self-control. Mark, I'm home! Oh. 
chocolate. Mm -hmm. Let me try that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I expected this to be much more fun, like a Willy Wonka moment. Mark, I'm home! Damn, we need a bigger ledge. <laughs> you gotta get in there. <laughs> I don't wanna lie, I just put makeup on. Well, whose fault is that? Tired of my mean. Something fair. I mean, clearly, you have much more experience spreading chocolate on people than I do. <laughs>